Welcome to the second part of the lecture on development processes. And while we talked about the more general development process of domain and application engineering in detail in the first part of the talk, uh, we haven't yet talked about uh, the implementation technique in a comparative manner. So we talked about the implementation techniques a lot in this course, um, and this part is not going to be uh, presenting new uh, information, but rather aggregate the information that you have an overview. What are the different implementation techniques? What are their strengths? What are their weaknesses? And the main thing uh, is why we have some such an emphasis on the implementation of product clients. There's a multitude of techniques. We will see that there are overall nine techniques and even more depending on how you count. And for all those techniques, it's interesting that there's not one technique that is superior to all of them, that rules them all, but it's rather that for every particular use case, we have to choose the right implementation technique. And that's kind of the main lessons learned of our course overall. When to choose which implementation technique for a product line um, and uh, in order to give you a, a position where you can uh, judge this, we have practical tasks where you try out some of the implementation techniques, but also uh, have had already five lectures on implementation techniques. And this is going to be a wrap up. So let's come to the recap. Uh, so we talked about runtime variability. In runtime variability, we have variables. Uh, we have states in our program, in the memory, in the uh, uh, local uh, like organization of the program. And those states, those variables, they identify how the system should behave. So at runtime, it is decide whether these graphs have colors or are weighted. And this is then taken into account um, in terms of the behavior of the system. So in most cases, all the source code is over there, but uh, the program behaves different depending on the configuration. And there are different ways how to configure those uh, systems with runtime variability. We looked at preference dialogues where we implement the variability, compile and run the program, and then we manually adjust preferences based on the configuration in terms of these dialogues. So this is a dialogue of the Eclipse uh, preferences where you can make some decisions and at runtime, those will be then respected by uh, all the algorithms in background. But there are also other ways. Uh, we can provide command line options, our configuration files, and then it's a bit different because this is typically uh, or also known as load time variability. So it's basically before, after we compile the program and before we run the program, we make a decision on those options, either in terms of a configuration file where we uh, can better automate this uh, because we can do not need to provide uh, all these command line options every time again all these command line options were rather like uh, we have a command line tool we use this command line tool and the idea is that we can uh, easily manipulate this uh, by running it on command line so uh, there's another uh, uh, strategy um, to uh, or to take into account, and this is whenever we take internally global variables to realize the runtime variability, then we can also think about immutable global variables, and there the situation is a bit different because the configuration happens already before compile time. And that's why immutable global variables, like uh, global variables, which uh, are fixed and cannot be changed at runtime and cannot be changed after compiling the program anymore, uh, they can be taken into consideration by the compiler. And this has some limited um, advantages because the compiler can remove some of the dead code. It can remove some local and simplify some local uh, statements. So basically, uh, what is missing with all those runtime techniques, it, uh, there's actually two dimensions. One is how to provide the configuration. And the other one is how is it implemented and realized. And we talked about global variables, about parameters, um, method parameters that are passed. 
um, there are more techniques and a particular use a special case of global variables is immutable global variables. So what is missing for all those automated generation? We do not have this for preference dialogues. Uh, when it comes to compile time variability, in most cases, we still have the same large binary because the program is compiled. Uh, when we go back to the last slide, we see that the program is compiled before we make the decision which features we have. So in those cases, we always have the same large uh, binary and uh, we are only like uh, having a very limited compile time variability for immutable global variables. So, uh, so this uh, basically means that runtime variability is a technique, but it's not well designed for the compile time variability, for having different products, for selling different products, which are also uh, yeah, uh, working on research, uh, resource uh, limited systems, like embedded systems and so on. This is probably not the best way to go. So basic principles of runtime variability are we have conditional statements that are controlled by some configuration options that are provided uh, by different techniques. And then we have global variables or method parameters to uh, propagate those um, uh, values uh, during the implementation. And we also talked about different design patterns and object orientation and how this can be used um, to support uh, those basic principles of runtime variability. But we have problems with runtime variability. We have conditional statements all over the place. We have code scattering and tangling. Uh, we have replication uh, of the code. Um, even if we uh, consider design patterns, then we still have the problem that there are particular trade-offs. So there are advantages of those design patterns, but there are also negative side effects. And constraints may restrict the usage in a way that we cannot always make uh, the, the best uh, possible decision. We've especially seen this in the last lecture, in the last part, when we talked about the tyranny of the dominant decomposition. So when it was coming to cross-cutting concerns, so we can find a modularization, but there will always be cross-cutting concerns. So there are uh, constraints on their usage. So the variable parts are typically always delivered and it's not well suited for compile time binding and the overall vision of product lines. Then we looked at clone and own as the second technique next to runtime variability, which is considered as ad hoc uh, reuse. Uh, the idea is that a new variant of a system is simply created by copying an existing and similar system and adapting it to uh, uh, the needs uh, of a particular new customer. Uh, and afterwards, these clone variants evolve independently of each other. And why this might work well if you only have like two products, uh, it's a matter of scale. So this is a technique that is not well suited for having uh, thousands or hundreds of products. Uh, so We've had this example of Alice, Bob, and Eve in the particular lecture, in lecture three, uh, where we've seen uh, that uh, the graph implementation here is copied and adapted to the needs. And it was actually not easy for Eve to achieve her implementation from the existing implementations because simple merge operations from version control systems do not help you. So how does it work? We implement a separate project uh, for each product. We uh, download uh, the project, check out the branch based on the configuration. Then we run build scripts if they're existent, uh, and then we can compile and run the program. So what is missing with clone and own is the compile time variability is only available for those implemented products. So we have to uh, have we have an effort in application engineering. If you think of the last part of the lecture again, we have an effort in application engineering for every single product because we need to clone, we need to adapt every single product. There's no automated generation for clone and own um, uh, with version control systems. There is some limited automated generation when we uh, consider using build systems in combination with clone and own. Uh, so we can have some extra files there uh, that are uh, generated, 
but this is very limited and especially we have no free feature selection. So all the build systems can do is to incorporate some files, remove some files, replace some files, but uh, we cannot freely select our features. We cannot configure our system in application um, analysis and then automatically derive the product, but there's uh, a lot of manual effort still during application design, application in implementation, and so also during application testing. Uh, so overall, this also means that whenever we have a lot of custom development going on during application engineering, this also means that the tests that we can already do for our domain are very limited. We can only uh, uh, yeah, uh, when it comes to clone and own, uh, we can think of some libraries or something like this that we can test in isolation. But as a clone is a completely new product, uh, we have uh, a lot of differences. We can change any part uh, during clone and own. Uh, it's, uh, it's domain testing is rather complicated with this process. So then we looked at conditional compilation where conditional compilation is, was the first technique uh, besides those ad hoc approaches that we looked at. And conditional compilation has the basic strategy that we model a variability in a feature model. We build some scripts, build scripts to include and ex exclude files based on our feature selection. And then we pass this feature selection at build time. So this is not to be confused with build systems, how we have used them for clone and own, but build systems, how we can use them for the conditional compilation. So we have one build script per group of related features. So we've had this example of this anesthesia device uh, where we have certain build scripts, but these build scripts are not produced for every clone, but they're rather produced for certain subsystems, for instance, the monitor or some libraries. Again, we have advantages, so there's no silver bullet. Uh, we have no uh, single solution that solves all the possible. We, uh, but advantages are that we have compile time variability. We can produce fast, small binaries with a smaller attack surface. Also, when it comes to um, the IT security, um, we have automated generation of arbitrary products. So we have a free feature selection. Uh, we do not need to implement uh, something for every particular um, uh, implementation. And if we decide that in our domain custom development is not needed, then the process and application engineering can be uh, completely automated. It allows the inclusion of individual files or uh, even an entire subsystem. So we have some modular variability, but only on a very high level. Um, in particular, the challenges, but these are changes of all the, uh, all the later techniques. We cannot configure at run or load time anymore. Um, uh, but this is also something that uh, was not designed uh, for product lines themselves. So there's, uh, for those of you that are interested to read in the literature, you might want to look for dynamic product lines. This is a subset of product line techniques that are designed to also allow reconfiguration at runtime. So the biscuits may become quite complex. We've seen some in our previous lecture. And uh, it's somehow limited what you can do. Uh, uh, it's, uh, these are hard to understand, hard to analyze. And the simple inclusion and exclusion of individual uh, lines or chunks of code is quite, it's, it's actually, it would be possible because build system are chewing complete and we can make arbitrary uh, changes to the source code. But overall, the granularity is on file level only. And we therefore looked at conditional compilation also with p processors. With p processors, we can have more fine granular um, mappings. So we can say a certain part of the code is mapped to the feature hello, or a certain part is feature mapped to the feature world. And then we can remove certain parts of the code where like hello and word are, for instance, included in a certain configuration. So a file is pre-processed pre -processed before the compilation. And this is why this is also called conditional compilation. 
Again, we have advantages like well-known mature tools. Uh, we have, they're easy to use because we just need to annotate and remove those parts. Um, it supports compile time variability as also the build systems. Uh, we have flexible arbitrary levels of granularity, even very fine-grained uh, variability is possible. Uh, we can handle code and non-code artifacts, so we have some kind of uniformity here and little pre-planning is required because we can always annotate uh, later on a system, but we have similar to runtime variability, the problem of scattering and tangling. Uh, we have no separation of concerns, so the concerns, the features are not modularized. We are mixing multiple languages in the same development artifact and uh, we have code obfuscation uh, unintended code obfuscation because those two languages uh, do not really align to each other and it's hard to read uh, preprocessor code, especially if there are many preprocessor uh, statements involved. It's also hard to analyze and process for existing integrated development environments and uh, software engineering tools in general. And uh, they're often used in an ad hoc and undisciplined fashion, uh, meaning that we can even uh, annotate a single character or within a name or something like this. Uh, all this is feasible with many preprocessors. And so they're prone to sub the syntax type and runtime errors. We've looked at some already and we will look in the next three lectures. Uh, what are those errors? Um, how can we handle those? And how can we detect those statically and dynamically? So the main problem with conditional compilation was that features were not modular. So the question is, why not using the basic constructs in software engineering to produce modular software and the basic constructs that have been invented like many decades ago are components. So the general idea here for implementing product lines with components would be every feature is implemented by a dedicated component and feature selection determines which component shall be integrated to form an application. So this is basically domain engineering. So we are building components and then we are writing glue code in application engineering to uh, connect those uh, system. This looks a bit weird on my system. It's okay, let's do this again. Um, uh, where like we still have some effort, uh, some uh, effort for providing glue code during the implementation. So the overall vision is rather like we build these components and then we just plug them together and everything works. In practice, we rather have that the existing components are limited in their functionality. Uh, they do not fit to each other. So we have a lot to do. And uh, the problem is that also uh, not everything, every feature in our domain, again, something that is in, of interest to any stakeholder, to customers in terms of requirements, is uh, can be modularized in the particular component. Uh, we talked about uh, examples like colors in our graphs, for instance, which are hard to modularize. We also talked about services and for services, it's a bit different because we are not providing glue code. But uh, the idea is very similar that we implement features as services, not as components. The feature selection determines the services to be composed. But again, we have this distinction of domain engineering and application engineering. It's a bit more structured than components because the service composition is a bit more standardized instead of like highly individual glue code, as we've seen this from uh, components. But still, there's a lot of effort during application engineering to connect all those services that are out there and to build these systems. So this will also not be applicable if we have uh, millions of different configurations. And that's where the framework uh, idea uh, uh, was born or uh, came into play, uh, at least in our lecture. Um, the idea is very similar. Features are implemented by plugins and the feature selection determines the plugins to be loaded or registered, but no glue code or explicit service composition is required. So this full automation is 
um, is feasible in terms of there's no application engineering needed, um, or almost no. Um, so we still have uh, like uh, the the implementation. Okay, my computer is lacking a bit. We still have the domain engineering, um, but uh, the application engineering breaks down to a pure selection. What are the features that I want to have for my system? And the rest can be fully automated. There's, uh, uh, there's no need for providing some glue code, for having some custom designs, and so on. We can still decide that for a certain customer, uh, we build some custom plugins, we build some custom extensions that will only be used by a particular customer. So uh, custom development is still possible in domain engineering, but not, um, not necessary in all cases. The problem with frameworks and plugins is the pre-planning problem. We need to pre-plan all the possible um, extensions in advance and uh, 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 especially a problem is that uh, also the modularity of features is only possible if we have uh, features that can be modularized into particular plugins and this is not always the case again we have cross-cutting concerns where the uh, the feature is actually uh, yeah spread all over several plugins so that's why components services and plugins are typically um, uh, combined with runtime variability to some extent to realize all those uh, features that are not cannot be modularized into this high level. And then we have the pre-planning problem. We discussed this. We have this for all, for components, for services and plugins that we need to know in advance. We need to foresee what are the relevant uh, features, uh, what are the relevant uh, plugins, components, services, uh, that are uh, to be provided and especially for plugins what are the hotspots that we want to provide what is the nature of future extensions and then we talked about languages that allow the modularization of cross-cutting concerns that try to overcome the tyranny of the dominant decomposition that uh, will be able to modularize along several dimensions this is why this is also known as multidimensional separation of concerns. And we talked about two techniques, feature-oriented programming and aspect-oriented programming. With feature modules, we implement something, um, all the code that uh, belongs to a certain feature in what is called a feature module. Um, these feature modules do not have these strict interfaces as we have for component services and plugins, but are rather a bit more relaxed. They're rather like a modularization. We uh, take, uh, take those parts of classes and split them among several files, and then we can compose them based on a selection of features. So over here, we select the feature base and direct it, and that's why we have only those features in our directed graph implementation. This is an easy to use language based mechanism. Uh, we only have minimal language extensions uh, for feature in the programming. We've seen that uh, for feature house, for instance, only one new keyword uh, original was needed. Conceptually, uh, this can be uniformly applied to code and other kinds of non code artifacts. Uh, separation of feature code uh, is, uh, is feasible into distinct feature modules, also for cross cutting concerns. Uh, we have little pre-planning involved because we can basically alter um, uh, classes in later uh, extensions and later feature modules in almost arbitrary fashion. And then we have uh, direct feature traceability because everything that belongs to a feature is located in a certain feature module, which happens to be typically a folder on our operating system. We have disadvantages because we, it requires the adoption of new language extension, composition tools. It has a, a very high effort on the tool support. The tools need to be constructed for every language. Uh, we've seen, uh, we've discussed Feature House. Feature House tries to uh, yeah, provide a framework which has, uh, gives some uh, share some uh, of the uh, uh, effort for multiple languages, but still, when it comes to tools, 
um, there's a lot of effort to be done. Endogranularity is restricted to method level, so we cannot, um, yeah, we cannot make arbitrary changes to in later feature modules. And that's when aspect-oriented programming came into play because we looked at the implementation of one feature by means of an aspect, and the feature selection determines which aspects are included into the weaving process. So uh, aspect weaving is the process of weaving aspects into the implementation and weaving because it's actually very fine grained. We can use, um, we can basically make every change to the program that we want by means of aspect orientation. But this also means we have a, a very complex uh, extension, extension mechanism and uh, it's hard to imagine how this can be done in a language independent fashion. Uh, so we looked at aspect J as an extension of Java oriented, uh, of object oriented programming with Java. Uh, so for uh, with support for these aspects then, uh, but uh, this is hard to imagine how this uh, can be done for non object oriented languages or even like non-code artifacts. The program evolution and maintenance is affected by the fragile point cut problem. And this is probably one of the main reasons why this was not uh, much continued. So there was a hype. Um, uh, yeah, uh, someone uh, between uh, 1990 and uh, 2000 or 2005, uh, where many people in industry tried out aspect on the programming, but the maintenance problems uh, were uh, problematic, but still there were a lot of uh, good things also about this approach that we could uh, separate uh, many things. Uh, we have little or no pre-planning uh, effort required and we can make fine-grained uh, extensions. So overall, we looked at many different implementation techniques and now we want to give you an overview. So what are the uh, what are the main characteristics of those uh, techniques and where do they have their strengths and weaknesses? So we will talk about compile time variability. Is the technique able to support compile time variability? Can we implement features? Can we, uh, yeah, will we have, be able to implement features in our systems? We will be able to automatically derive products. Uh, so can we, uh, automatize uh, the uh, domain design and domain implementation if there are new, no uh, unknown requirements and whether we have feature traceability. So the first technique that we looked at was one-time variability, which was good because we could realize features. Features are just breaking down into uh, Boolean variables uh, in the source code. Uh, we kind of have the automated product gen uh, generation, except for preference dialogues, because preference dialogues have, like, we provide all the information uh, at runtime in the preference dialog and not at load or compile time. We have no feature traceability. Um, you could say we can look for all the occurrences of a variable, but uh, in practice, this is uh, actually uh, much more complicated because the value of a feature can be encoded somehow in the state. So it will be hard to locate all the possible parts. Uh, for those of you that are uh, familiar with this, uh, uh, there is some sophisticated program slicing and so on would be needed to identify all the parts that are influenced by certain features. And we basically have no compile time variability. We have very limited compile time variability with immutable global variables. So. And then we looked how to improve on the compile time variability. We looked at clone and own where we have compile time variability, but we don't have features anymore. We have no automated generation except some limited generation with build systems. And we still do not have feature traceability. So these were the two ad hoc uh, techniques that we were uh, uh, talking in the uh, second and third lecture. So then we were talking about more like product line, uh, product line-ish uh, techniques. Uh, for instance, build systems. And with build systems, we wanted to improve. We still wanted to have compile time variability, but wanted to implement features. And this is possible, but only for coarse-grained features, because with build systems, we can only support um, 
uh, yeah, a composition, uh, conditional compilation on file-based level. Uh, we have an automated uh, generation based on the build system, so we can provide our feature selection and generate the products. Um, and feature traceability is uh, possible in a limited fashion, at least in terms of some, some tool support. For more details, I refer to the fifth lecture and the third part in it. And then we looked at preprocessors, and the advantage of our build systems is that they support fine-grained variability, but still not all the possible variabilities. So if, I, if I'm thinking about I want to include a whole folder, a whole library, uh, preprocessors will not help here. And this is why these two uh, techniques are often combined in practice. For instance, the Linux kernel is using build system and preprocessors together for conditional combination. But still, we were not very happy with the feature traceability. It's only feasible by means of tool support. And uh, not all is located in the module. So we wanted to improve this with components and services where we have feature traceability, at least for those features that we were able to modularize in a component or a service. And these are typically coarse-grained features. So only for some of the features, we have feature traceability. but uh, we uh, kind of lost the uh, automated product generation here because uh, we always need to provide glue code or we need to connect those services. And then we were trying to improve the situation in terms of the product generation uh, because uh, or what we have uh, in addition or what is the, the change with plugins is that we do not write glue code over and over again, but we reuse the glue code if you want. So we write a framework where we can plug in certain um, uh, extensions, the plugins. We have uh, pre-planned extension points. And of course, there are always more things involved. For instance, is pre-planning uh, needed? And there's a lot of pre-planning needed here. And we only support features and feature traceability on a very coarse-grained level. And then we looked at feature modules and aspects, and we improved those two things also for uh, for features and feature traceability because everything can be modularized now. Um, you could argue that for aspects, uh, they are more designed like uh, an aspect is simply one file where all the source code is in there, that this is not uh, well designed for coarse grained variability. But in general, we have compile time variability. We can implement features. We can automatically generate products based on a feature selection. And we can find all the source code, all the other documents uh, together in the implementation. So we have feature traceability uh, for aspects uh, only for source code, but for feature modules also for other non-code artifacts. And of course, there are other um, interesting um, criteria that I will not talk about here in detail um, about interfaces between features. So which, which of those techniques provide us interfaces between features? Which of those techniques require code duplication? And which of those uh, enable us to modularize cross-cutting concerns and overcome the tyranny of the dominant decomposition? So. The lessons learned of this part, this was a recap of all the implementation techniques we discussed. Uh, we talked about nine implementation techniques, um, depending on how you count what is a, a separate technique. But we've had uh, these nine techniques mentioned on the previous slide. And there are different strategies, even like for runtime variability. We talked about three strategies to implement it. For clone and own, we talked about three uh, dedicated strategies. But this was all ad hoc. Um, techniques, uh, so we, uh, I wasn't going into more detail on the last slide on those. And in addition, there are different configuration strategies for one-time variability in terms of preference dialogues as one of those three techniques. And we can make a choice based on those four criteria, but in practice, we have many more uh, uh, things that are uh, taken to be into consideration. For instance, the plea planning involved uh, will I be able to foresee all the potential extension in the future? If I will not be able, then a framework is probably not a good idea, for instance. So there's some further reading. And now you could think of those three criteria again and go back to the last slide um, and uh, think about uh, 
which of those techniques enable interfaces between features, which of these, those techniques require the most code duplication or code clones, and which techniques can modularize cross-cutting concerns. I was glad to have you here, and uh, you might want to have a look at the previous slide to see again where you can uh, yeah, answer those three questions. Hope to see you again in the next video. Bye.